We're going to take the next few weeks. Uh, I'm kind of looking over some things right now, what we're going to be doing next. But uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to, we're going to be kind of uh, what I call drop back punting rather than having subject matter, although some of it is subject matter. What I want to do is I want to take uh, three or four weeks anyway. And what I want to learn is what I want to begin to do is teach a little bit about discipleship. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about discipleship in the C1B1 series uh, that has been being preached on Sunday mornings. Uh, I, I want to take a couple of weeks, and for some of you, that this may be, it may be a little bit of old hat. Uh, to some of you who are, who are newer, it, it may not be. Some of the stuff may be, may be brand new, I don't know. But whatever level of Christianity may be in, I know one thing, it's always good sometimes to go, to go back, to some, back to some basics. Uh, the, the, a lot of people ask, well, today we're going to look at grace. Uh, how do you grow in grace? Uh, how do you, how do you, a lot of people ask the question, what is grace? How do you explain grace uh, and, what, and what, God, what God truly has done for us? Uh, we're going to take a look at how do you grow in grace. We're going to look at how do you grow in knowledge. Uh, how do you grow in faith? How, how, are, how are these things uh, manifested that we can't actually put our hands on? And, and get, I can't give you a cup of grace. And, and, just, and just say, let, let's, let's measure it by, by this. So how do you grow in these things? We're going to look at some different things in the Bible. Uh, that, I, that are, I'm sure are going to help you along the way uh, of your of discipleship and, and, of, and of truly uh, growing in the Lord and growing closer to God, which is something really and truly, folks, I'll tell you, uh, you just turn on the news one night. We, we really have got to get a hold of this thing, uh, get a hold of this thing called Christianity, because I'm going to tell you something, times are, times are so short. Times are so very, very short. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for the coming of Jesus Christ at any day. I, I'm not, I'm not waiting for the end of the year, next year, or the year after that. I think it's, I think it's right around the corner. Uh, so today, let's look at the concept of the, the concept of grace. Uh, the, it, it's very interesting. The, um, the effect, the miracle, I guess, what we would call the miracle of conception. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that happen at, at conception. And uh, scientists are, are just are really, they're trying to learn everything that really happens at, at conception. They, they've, they've narrowed it down to some things. They understand some things that, that begin to happen. Uh, you're, you're, you're the color of your eyes, uh, some of the predisposition to your character uh, it is, is put into there. Obviously, whether you're male or whether you're female happens. Either. There are some things at conception that you and I have absolutely 100% no control over. It is the, mir it is the miracle uh, that happens at that at that particular time in, in your life, uh, the the instant of the instant, if you would, of your life. Um, there's other things that are, we are affected by uh, the the nature of things around us, the course of actions that happen around us. That really we we do begin to get affected by. This is the concept that Christ began that Christ began to give when he said at at uh, at salvation that you and I become what a new creature. We, we become something. He said, behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Not some things. It ain't a few things in your life. Uh, it is absolute. It is a turning around in your life. It is a born again experience at the point of salvation. Uh, your character, your ideas, everything about you now changes because your focus is no longer to the world. Your focus is no longer to you. It's no longer to the things that you desire or the things that you may want. That's not your life anymore. The Bible says you are born again. And therefore, this, uh, that's why I like the idea of conception, the things that begin to happen inside of there. Uh, there's a blueprint of you that was made at conception. If you begin to study, uh, gen, uh, what do they call them, uh, gen, not, not genealogical codes, uh, genetic, genetic codes and, and stuff like this, it's crazy what, what, what goes on at, at the moment of conception. And yet, this thing here's going to drive me nuts now again. And yet, I think about born again. At that moment in your time, God puts a blueprint in you for what he wants you to be doing. Uh, every person in this room, every person that hears my voice today, you've got to understand something. God has got a blueprint for you for what he wants you to be doing and how he wants you to be doing it. So think about the idea of when you're born again, that now you've got a, something in your life that God wants you to be doing. 
The question is, what is it? How do we find out what it is? Uh, I love the idea of the grace, the grace of God and what God did for you and I uh, at the moment of being, of being born again. Grace is this. Yes, I'm <laughs> That's a good point to edit there, Andy. <laughs> Great grace is this, G R A C E. Uh, I love her. She just takes care of me, makes sure things are taken care of all the time. <laughs> uh, grace is G R A C E. Uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace, absolutely in a nutshell. God's grace is not something that you can live without. Uh, God's grace is not a luxury. God's grace is an absolute necessity. It is an absolute necessity for every person walking the face of the earth today. It is not something that anybody can do without. Uh, we begin to look at what God's riches are and how, and how they are. Uh, if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, and I'm going to give a lot of scripture today. Uh, if you want to take notes, if not, I'll, I'll try to write these down for you, or you can watch the video online and I'll say it again. Um, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verses 8 to 10, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Why were you created? For good works. You were created, the, the born again experience, for that. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a wonderful thing, folks, that to think about the idea that there is absolutely nothing you could do to prepare for the grace of God. There's nothing that you have done that would deserve the grace of God. There's, abs there's nothing anywhere about you that would deserve God's grace, except for the fact that that's just who He is. God's grace is for everybody. I'm going to share a verse with you. I think it's out of Ephesians later, uh, later on in this lesson. Uh, to show you, a lot of people think that God's grace is only for Christians. And in a sense, that, may, that, that is true, but it's not completely true. Because God's grace is what drew you and I to salvation. It's by the grace of God. Remember this, folks, God's hand is always reaching out to you. Even the, the unsaved people of this world... God is reaching out to them. God wants them to be saved. He wants them pulled into the fold. It's, and that is, that's the grace of God. Now, after you're saved, there's grace abundancies that begin to flow in our lives. That it's by the grace of God that so many things are able to be worked through you and I. That's by the grace of God also. But for the world out there, for those that don't know Christ, the grace of God is what draws them into salvation. The grace of God is what drew you and I to be born again into this life that we live right now. That's all part of this, of this concept of the grace of God. If you look at Ephesians uh, verses 1 to 3, uh, just, just for a little background, he begins to show the character of sin, the nature of sin, if you will. If you begin to look at verse 4 and verse 5 in that chapter right there, he now shows the turning point of what happens. In, in salvation. And then we, then, we, then we kicked into the verses we just got done reading, and he begins to talk about this grace, the grace of God, which begins to change everything around, where you've been saved through faith. We've got to understand, we've got to begin to understand what grace is. How is salvation a sign of God's grace? Uh, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. I want you to hear it again. It is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Absolute, 100%, folks, it is the gift of God Almighty that you and I are sitting where you are today. Outside the grace of God, outside of the grace of God, 
I have no idea where you and I would be today. And we've got to begin to understand that because what that begins to do is it begins to swell up a, a sense of praise and worship in your soul. Well, you begin to realize, I am nothing. I am dirt. I am mud. I am absolutely nothing. I am the filth of rags that is walking around the face of this earth. That's who I am. And then by the grace of God, he reached down to me one day, and I saw, and I saw what he was doing, and I accepted him as my Savior. Not by anything I did, but strictly by his love and by, and by, and by, and by his grace. Who knows? Who many, of, many of us would, would be in a lot of different places today uh, had, it not, had it not been for the grace of God. So how, how is salvation a sign of God's grace? It's a wonderful gift from God. It's His absolute unmerited favor, and there's nothing you can do to ever earn, to ever earn anything He's going to do for you. Uh, because we were incapable of reaching out to God, He, by His grace, reached down to us. Have you ever thought about that idea that you are actually or were actually incapable of actually reaching out to Him? That's why the world, folks, does not necessarily come to Christ every time, because they're incapable of reaching out to God. But it never means that God is not reaching down to them. That's where God begins to use you and I as the tools. Paul talked about it many times. And in, in, in his writings, he says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the least, I'm the least, or, or he says, I'm the least amongst the apostles. He says, I'm the greatest amongst the sinners. Paul began to talk about all these things. Paul knew who he was. Paul recognized who he was, and Paul recognized everything that he had ever done. He says, it's only by God's grace that I'm able to do what I do. And you, and you begin to think about it, that's a humbling experience. Paul wrote, Probably 75, 80 percent of your New Testament, folks. This was a man of God, a great man of God, uh, in, the, in the in the early church, and yet even he recognized who he really was. Today in America, we've got a sense of pride that has been built up inside of us. You and I have grown up with it. We've got a sense of pride, saying you're somebody, that you're something, that you can do things, that you that that. There, you understand what I'm saying? There, there's a sense in every one of us of elevating ourselves. And therefore, what's happened, folks, is we have a problem humbling ourselves to the level that we need to be. I think I've told you before, I'm telling you, go back to Jeremiah chapter 18, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, and look where God sent him when God wanted to teach him something. One of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah. And yet, where does God send him? Down to the potter's house. One of the lowliest jobs in the, in the entire city. And yet, this man who's sitting down there spinning the wheel and forming clay, God says, Jeremiah, I need you to go down there because that's where I'm going to teach you something. Now, I love it the way God does it. The way he begins to show you and I who we really are. He's trying to help you. He's trying to help me to realize who we are. And then when we realize really and truly who we are, the reason a lot of Christians today are having problems in their walk with the Lord is they don't really realize who they were or who they are. And therefore, how much of God's grace do I need? If I, if I, can, if I can do things, if I can make it on my own, if I can study the Word of God, and if I can understand it, and if I can read it enough to understand it to where I can teach other people and show other people things, well, how much of God do I really need? Do you understand where I'm coming from? That, that's where we are. And as Americans, folks, you have grown up in a culture that has taught you that. And therefore, uh, in, in, the, in our society today, we don't look to where we need God as much as we really do need Him. Before you're saved and after you're saved. We need, we need the grace of God Almighty. Grace defined. It's all of God's riches. God's riches at Christ's expense. Think about, I don't know if you've ever actually sat down and pondered the idea, my friends, but think about what Christ really did. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I would just soon stay there. I, I don't, 
You know, when, when I get to heaven, I, I, I don't, I, right now, in my, in my, in my uh, finite mind, I don't have an interest in leaving heaven uh, to come back down here to earth again. I, I'm, I'm going to be real happy where I'm at. Uh, that, that, that's, where I'm, that's my target. That's where I'm headed for what I want to do. But God, in His grace and in His love, manifested Himself on the earth in the life and the body of Jesus Christ. That's why I tell people that Jesus Christ was God from His head to His feet. He did not get His uh, um, deity at the age 30, which some of your notes and your commentators are teaching today. No, no. He was God manifested inside of Mary. At, at birth, he was, he's all, he was always God. And yet, he, he manifests himself in, in the man Jesus Christ. 100% man and 100% God. And, and yet, why did he do it? So that 33, later, 33 years later, he could hang on a cross for you and I. Came for no other reason. He came to die. He already knew. When, when he manifested himself in the body of Jesus Christ, in the man Jesus Christ, he already knew what was ahead. He knew why he was here. How many of us would be willing to make that kind of sacrifice for mankind? It, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just, I, I use the word crazy. It's crazy. It, it, the, the love is just absolutely out of this world. The love that God's got for you and I. God's got the same love, my friends, for every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of this earth. I do not care what you have done. I do not care where you have been. I don't care who you were or what you were, the things you've done, the people you've hurt. Okay? I understand what I'm saying when I say I don't care. It, because it doesn't matter. You can still come to Christ. God still loves that person as much as he loves you and I. And that's what we've got to begin to truly get a hold of. God's grace is for everybody. The entire world, God's grace is sitting out there ready for them simply to reach up, to reach up to God Almighty and let his grace begin to flow down. Grace defined, God's riches at Christ's at Christ expense. If you look over... <coughs> Let me, let, me, let, me, let me go one step further with that. Because in what ways are believers God's work, workmanship and what are we supposed to be doing? I want you to understand that if you have been born again, that the grace of God, the love of God, is inside of you now. That's who you are. And therefore, because you have become a new workmanship in Christ that the world should be able to see Christ in who you are. I tell folks all the time, uh, if, you have, if, you have, if you have been born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Uh, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I very much so believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not where you get more of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear this very carefully. It's not where you get more of the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit doesn't come in doses. Okay, you got him. Okay, it's salvation. He, he, he inherited your, your, your life, okay, your body. It's not where you get more of the Holy Spirit. It's where the Holy Spirit gets more of you. That's the baptism and the Holy Spirit. It's not where you get more of him. It's where he gets more of you. And that's, and that, and, and that's I tell folks all the time, if you, if, you, if you have been saved, you've got the Holy Spirit living in you. God did not save you and then leave you and, leave and pull the Holy Spirit out of you and tell you, well, until you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're on your own. That's, that's not the God that I serve, okay? So that's not what he did. The Holy Spirit is in you. And therefore, if you've got God, you've got the Holy Spirit, and he's living inside of you, should the world not see God through you? At salvation, you were not filled up halfway. At salvation, you were filled up all the way. And it's up to you and I, it's up to us as people to begin to take that all the way and keep it all the way filled up. The problem is we got up from the altar. And when we walk back out into life, the things of life, the ways of life, the world around us begins to 
try to pull some of that down. And therefore, we've got a job to make that grow back up. It's like a glass filling up with, like a glass filling up with water. We've got to keep that glass full. And the more of God that you put inside of you, folks, I've, I've, I've got a glass of water I, did, I, I use sometimes in some of my uh, sermons, that I, I, it's halfway full. If, if your glass is only halfway full, you've got enough room for air. The water is the Holy Spirit. You don't, want, you don't want room for the world. You don't want room for the things of the devil. You don't want room for the things of the demonic world. You want to fill that glass all the way up to the top, and therefore there is no room inside of you for nothing else. I'm not saying you're going to be 100% sinless right off the bat. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, but, I, but I am saying this, folks, that God has given you and I through His grace and through His love, God has given you and I every single thing you need to live this Christian life. Do not try to convince me, do not try to tell me that you cannot do something that God has commanded us to do in His Word. You, will, you won't get by with it with me. Because God's Word says that He has given you and I every tool, every strength of power, everything you need to do exactly what He has commanded you and I to do. If that is not true, then you might as well take this Bible and throw it in the garbage because it's of, it's, of, it's of no avail. God's Word is true. It is the truth. It speaks about that over and over and over again. And so therefore, you have got the tools. God has given you the power. God's given you the strength through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I hear people all the time, well, the reason God sent the Holy Spirit is for the gifts of the Spirit. That's only an evidence of the Holy Spirit is what that is. Why God gave you the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit for strength. For strength to live this life. For the comfort to live this life. And yet what did Jesus say when, when, he, left, when he left the earth? He says, I'm sending a, a comforter. I'm sending another. Okay, for what? For strength, for power. The Bible says for instruction. I don't know whether you know it or not. You can't understand this Bible. You hear this good and put it in your back pocket. You cannot understand this Bible outside of the Holy Spirit. You might be able to write reports on it, and you might be able to teach the words that are on the page, but you will not understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. It can't happen. Another reason why God's not going to remove the Holy Spirit from you. Not going to happen. So therefore, He's given you everything about the Holy Spirit to give you strength, the power, to comfort you in, in times of need. This is why God's given Himself through the Holy Spirit for you and I as we walk this earth. That, my friends, is the abounding grace of God Almighty. God is good. God, 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 He's so very good. Uh, I've, I've, I've challenged people, and I'll, 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 I'll challenge everybody here today. Uh, I've, there's, a, there's a burden that, that God has really placed on my heart. Um, to encourage people to draw closer to a relationship uh, with, with, with Christ. And then part of that, <clears throat> part of that is I've challenged people to pray at least three times a day. Um, now, I want you to understand what I mean by, by pray. Uh, I don't mean driving down the road or walking down the hallways. That's not what I'm talking about, although I want you to continue doing that. Uh, I, I want you to continue talking to God con to continually. Um, but I want people to set aside three times a day, morning, noon, uh, at night, or morning, afternoon, and night. And I want you to spend some time with God, whether that's a few minutes, whatever it may be. God's really burdened my heart with this to challenge people with this because God wants a relationship with you and I. That, that's what God's looking for. God's not looking for somebody who can simply talk about the Word of God. God's looking for people who understand the Word of God, and that's through the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Holy Spirit is going to give you and I. He's going to give you the internal knowledge of this book. And therefore, I'm challenging people because there's something in my heart that says we've got, God's really burdened me with the idea we have got to get back to a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to. We've got to get back to an old-fashioned gospel that was taught so many, many years ago, that was written over 2,000 years ago. We've got to get back to what this Word says and stop trying to 
um, make the word be what you and I want it to be. We've got to stop it. And God's saying, relationship, relationship, relationship. You've got to understand me. How do we get that? I'm challenging people three times a day. I want you to, I want you to stop doing what you're doing, and I want you to go into a quiet place where it's just you and God, and I want you to talk to Him. Many people say, I don't know what God wants in my life. I don't know um, where I am really in my Christianity. My first question is, how much do you pray? How much, how much time do you really spend with God? And, you know, don't forget the conversation is a two-way street. Okay? There's a time to talk and there's a time to shut up. If you never stop talking, how are you going to hear God? There's a time, folks, where we just got to be quiet. And we've got to hear the voice of God. And standing on the Word of God, and every promise He's got in His Word, I promise you this, that if you will spend time with Him in intimate prayer with Him, He will speak to you. He will tell you things. And you'll hear that voice of God. You'll hear what He's got, you'll hear what he's got to say. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about in ways, I, I'm going to go outside because it's something God God's revealed to me. It's going to be outside of the Word of God. He's going to, I'm talking about He's going to talk to you. I don't know if you're going to hear an audible voice or not, but I'm telling you, when you hear the voice, you'll know it. And God will begin, God will begin to move on you and begin, and begin to speak to you and, and begin to move you in, in, in different ways. And yeah, will He continue talking through the Word? Absolutely. I'm telling you folks, three times a day is the Word I've been given. Three times a day, you spend time with God. Find some place that you could be with God, whether that's five minutes with Him or 15 minutes with Him. But spend it, because God is looking for a relationship with people. God wants to do so much through you and I. He wants to reveal Himself in so many ways down here on this earth right here. As we come to the last days, God's grace, folks, is still flowing on this earth. God's grace is still moving all over. God's hands are still reaching all the way down to this earth. And God's saying, you who know me, you who know me, you've got to begin to let me work through you. You are my instruments. You are my way. You're not just a Christian. You're an instrument of God now. You're, some, you're someone that God can use. You are that potter in Jeremiah 18. Not the potter. You're the pot. God's the potter. And God wants to mold you and make you. And yet sometimes as you read that story, the potter had to crush the pot. And he had to start all over again and build it back up again. God, let God form you and make you into what He wants you to be. And, and some of you people are going to be teapots. Some of you are going to be flower pots. Some of you are going to be all the different pots that a potter makes. We're not all going to be teapots. Let God work through you and what He's got. Let God's grace begin to flow through you. Let people see the love of God through you. That may cause you to say something to somebody, and then a lot of times you ain't got to say nothing. But just show them. Just show them the love of God Almighty. People today have learned one thing. People today lack one crucial element. People today lack love. Because people, people today don't love anymore. People love themselves. They really do. And then therefore, people today are looking for somebody to love them. They're, they're, they really are. And people are looking for genuine love. And whether you're aware of it or not, you're completely incapable of giving genuine love outside of Jesus Christ. You're completely incapable. People have, people have argued that point before. That, 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 that's cool. Um, but I, I just simply I don't believe it because I believe that God is love. And therefore, outside of God who is love, how can I possibly manifest that love? I don't have it. He's got it. And therefore, my supreme love for him allows me to be able to display that love to other people. Um, that's why he said in, 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 uh, when he talked about the home, uh, he said, husbands, love your, love your wife as Christ first loved the church. I don't love her 
for who she is. I don't love her for anything that I've got to give her. I don't have anything to give her outside of my supreme love for God. As Christ loved me, as Christ loved the church, I pass that love on to her. As I love her, as I give that supreme love to God Almighty, I'm allowed to pass that love on to somebody else. And it's far beyond any kind of physical love. Far, far, far beyond that. It has nothing to do with physical love, really, in a lot of ways. It's the love of God. It's the love of God. That's what it is. Um, grace. Uh, grace defined. God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, grace enables us. Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 and 12. <coughs> uh, Titus two eleven and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness. Now, I want you to listen to what the grace of God does here, okay? For the grace of God has appeared. It brings salvation to all people. That's what grace, the grace does. And also, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So let's take a look at what the grace of God here does. I, I, what Titus is saying right here, Okay. The grace of God appears and brings salvation to all people. By the grace of God, we have salvation. That, that's what it does. That's what verse 11 says, okay? By His grace, we have salvation. Verse 12, it teaches us or it trains us to renounce. This is what does it. The grace of God does this, right? The grace, the, the grace of God teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And it, and it teaches us or trains us to live self-controlled, upright, um, and godly lives in this present age. And I, and, I, and I like what it says in the present age. That's a verse that was written for all times. Because whatever age you're living in, whatever period of time that you're living in, uh, when I speak of ages, I'm talking about very simply hundreds and thousands of years. But when he, when he begins to talk about this, whatever age you're reading in, that verse applies. So that verse applies to you and I today because, the, because, of, the way, because of the way it's written. Well, uh, grace is not, is not only the unmerited favor that brings salvation, it also enables us to live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. Outside of the grace of God, you cannot live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. That's by His grace that you and I are allowed, that you and I can, can, can even do such a thing. What, so what does it teach us not to do? In verse, in verse 12, what does it teach us not to do? It teaches us, not to, it teaches us um, to renounce ungodliness, and it teaches us to uh, renounce all worldly passions. Think about what we're doing. Think about what we're doing here. Ungodliness. Ungodliness is an irreverence for the things of God. Ungodliness is any irreverence to the things of God. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we begin to look, I've mean, got a lot of notes here, I'm trying to scramble through this. The worldly lusts or passions, they refer to desires that characterize those who do not know or live for the Lord. So <coughs> we have ungodliness, which is an irreverence for the things of God. Anything that, that, uh, that is not what we call a thing of the Lord or that God wants to do, that's called ungod and that is called ungodliness. If we have worldly lusts or passions, they refer to desires in your life that characterize those things, uh, those who do not know the Lord. So worldly lusts are the thing, if you're going to look at the things that are ungodly, anything that is outside the perfect will of God, that becomes ungodly. Uh, now, uh, we've got this, this new thing going around about the perfect will of God or the permissive will of God. Oh, my. If you ever get into that teaching, make sure you call me before you get into it, okay? Uh, there's people out there teaching this right now, okay? Number one, I'm going to give you a couple quick things here because I'm going to get back in this lesson. The permissive will of God ain't found nowhere in the Bible. I've looked it up. You know, I'll save you some time. It ain't, it ain't in there, okay? There's nowhere you're going to find the permissive will of God. You will find the perfect will of God mentioned in the Bible, when it talks about the will of God, it's mentioned one time in the Bible, it's mentioned the perfect will of God. Because God only has one will. And you know what? It's perfect. Okay? But what people are doing today is taking this permissive will of God, and they're saying that we can step outside the will of God, but you're still serving God, but you're in the permissive will of God. 
And that's what they're teaching. You can step outside of what God wants you to be doing, but don't worry about it. You're still in the love of God. You're still serving God. And it's called the permissive will of God. And it's a huge teaching that's sweeping our nation. It started a few years ago. Now it's really beginning to really catch up. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can justify who you are and what you are all you want, but there's going to come a day, and you mark my words, the Bible standing on the holy word of God, there is coming a day where you are going to stand before a righteous God. And when that righteous God, he is going to pass a righteous judgment on every person who is living, on the face of every person who has lived, every person that will live. He is a righteous God, and everything about him is perfect, everything about him. There's a lot more involved inside that teaching. I'm telling you, if you ever get involved, if you ever hear the teaching, stay away from it. Because there's a lot of things in that teaching that are garbage. And I've heard what people are doing today. What we're doing, folks, is that we are justifying who we are. David is the example they use. Well, when David looked at, uh, was it Bathsheba? When he, when he looked down him, David was not outside the will of God. David was in the permissive will of God. He was what? So God has a permissive will of God that says, I can look at naked women and I'm okay? No. Okay, not, not my Bible, we ain't going to find that, okay? No, David was outside the will of God when he did that. I'm sorry. So, he just got me on a round up there. But that we have, we have got to get, we got to get back to who and what God is and what God wants you and I to be doing. That, that's, that's a fact. Grace enables us to do what? To live inside the perfect will of God. God, let me tell you something, folks. You and I are going to go through a lot of things. Some of you in here are going through some things. Um, different people in the church are going through some different things. We are all going to experience different things on different, on different levels. Uh, whatever you're going through, I'm going to tell you right now, is important to you. And therefore, I, I, I don't characterize things that people are going through as, well, that's really, really, really hard, or that's not so bad at all. Because whatever you're going through is always important to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I believe that with all my heart. You and I are going to experience a lot of things. But I want you to hear this, my friends, that God's grace... And God's love has never left you. Never, ever has it ever left you. Every time you think, and I think about people in the Bible <coughs> who, um, who rejected God's grace. Uh, think, back to, uh, like, think back to Cain. Uh, Cain was given a chance. God just simply didn't accept his, 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 uh, his offering. Had Cain repented of, his, of what he did and brought God what was doing, we wouldn't have the story of Cain and Abel. It would be a different story completely. But he didn't. He rejected what God had, had commanded what God and what God uh, wanted in, inside, inside of what he was doing. Uh, we look at Judas. Uh, Judas was one of the twelve. Judas walked and talked with Jesus Christ. He was taught with, by Jesus for the three years that Christ, that Christ was in his ministry up here. Okay, And yet Judas did what? Judas was the betrayer. He betrayed Christ also. Uh, we have Demas, uh, who is a fellow worker of Paul's. Who we, we find down the road that Demas left the ways. And uh, the Bible says, having loved the present world. Folks, if you and I are going to turn and we are going to love this present world, if we are going to walk a life that is going to love this present world, I'm going to tell you something. You've got a life. You're living a life that has some ungodly worldly lust built into it. Now, you may say, you don't have no right to judge me on that. Well, I'm not judging you. I'm warning you. We've got to turn from the things of this world, and we've got to begin to turn back to the grace of God that only He can give. Think about, again, who you were and where you came from. Think about what you are right now. We've got, you, you, you think about, where I thought I was happy at one time, where I thought I had peace at one time, man, I didn't have nothing compared to what I got now. Because what I've got now, I wake up in the morning, it's still there. And when I come home from work, after a hard day at work, in the trials and tribulations, I still got that. I've still got what he gave me. Okay, I, that doesn't leave me. I don't got to go find nobody to give me nothing in my body to give me, to give me another sense of peace. Oh, no. I've got it day in and I've got it day out. God's peace, God's grace is always flowing down to you, to you and I. <coughs> uh, grace is received. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, 
in verse 7. Um, there's a couple different things to talk about. Let me, let me read uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, because this is really cool. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. He says, since then, uh, we're talking about Jesus as the great high priest. Uh, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. He doesn't say to hold on to it loosely. He says to hold fast, tightly grip, uh, what, what, what tightly gripped our confession of what we've done. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You do not serve a God who is unable to sympathize with your weaknesses. You do not serve a God who is unable to sympathize with the, with the, uh, the low parts of your life or the, the weaknesses in your life. No, you don't serve a God uh, like, like that. He says, we do not serve a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. What you and I face today, what you and I are going through, whatever you are facing, God has already faced it. Jesus already walked through it. Jesus knows who you are, what you are, and what you're going through. He goes on in verse 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, because of what Christ has done, because Christ knows who you are, what you are, and what you're going through. What does he say? He says, draw near to the throne of grace. Don't stand, don't stand far off from it. Don't stand away from it, my friends. Draw near to it so that we may receive mercy and find the grace in a help in a time of need. You draw near to the throne of God Almighty. You draw not, again, I'm going to say it again, don't stand away from it. Draw near to it. Why? So that you can receive the mercy and the grace in your time of need. The problem we have, folks, when we have a time of need, when we have things we're going through, too many times we're trying to go through them on our own. And you have got a God of the universe, the creator of everything you see in this entire universe. He put it all together. You have got a God out there who wants to reach down and who wants to help you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you've been through. God is still there. And the grace of God Almighty is there to enable you through whatever you're going through. Know that. And know that today. He gives us faithful service. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll... I may talk about a couple more things here in Grace next week. Uh, but I want to get into faith also because faith and mercy, uh, faith and grace kind of kind of intertwine together.